morning, folks. Good morning. So, what are we going to do this morning? Exercise. <laughs> <laughs> I was, was going to show you how to dance. Okay? How to dance, you know. <laughs> and sing. And sing, right? <laughs> <laughs> we can do that. We can do that. I, I, I can't sing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. But let's uh, let's uh, move on to uh, uh, you know the, uh, the, the session for today. Um, I think a good uh, lead-in is uh, I think a lot of people um, have an interest in essentially you know the, the challenges of actually being able to manage the form processes. Okay? I mean, it's, it's in the end, you know, that's where the action is. Remember, well, it's the how. You know? The what, the why, well, you kind of do very well at that, you know? But it's the how. How do you actually get things moving and how do you actually make progress towards, you know, reaching whatever it is, you know, the, the end state you want to reach, right? Now, uh, uh, strategic communication is very important in that context because, you know, that's what, that's, that, that, the tools of strategic communication are what you need to actually bring people in. You know, bring people into the process as you move along. And sometimes you also need strategic communication tools to kind of neutralize the opposition. You know, because there are people out there, no matter what you do, you know, are not going to like what you're doing, right? They're going to do everything that they can to actually just sort of say, we don't want you to succeed. So how can you use strategic communication tools actually for them? Okay. Now, uh, what I'd like to do today, uh, this morning, is actually walk you through a uh, uh, fairly, uh, which tends to be fairly uh, uh, conceptual, uh, you know, um, uh, area, sometimes quite complex, you know. But understanding these concepts are very useful for work on the ground, you know, particularly in the type of communications that you, you need to do. So by being able to uh, what I would say, recognize these patterns, you know, you will be better able to actually formulate a particular strategy at a given point in time, okay? So a lot, a lot of people, they don't realize this, you know, but, but if you have a good understanding of these different concepts, your, 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 your communication strategy will just be much, much better targeted, okay? Now, this is a challenge. This has always been a challenge for us because uh, a lot of this comes from, uh, you know, economic theory, microeconomic theory, and, 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 uh, and particularly advanced microeconomic theory. So what, 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 what I've tried to do here is essentially bring this down to a level that's really practical. It, 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 you know, it, it doesn't deal with all the nuances and, and, and subtleties that come with economic theory. That's not important. The important thing is for you to just get the gist of it because that's what you need in terms of formulating uh, a communication strategy, okay? All right, now, the way to think about this is, uh, to think about it as, you, as you're progressing through you know, a, a reform process, you know, there are certain patterns that might emerge, right? Sort of like when you're fighting a battle, you know? You recognize certain patterns, oh, well, the troop movements are moving here and all that, or this looks like this, so we better act this way, you know? Think of it this way, these things are sort of like, you know, there's, there, there are certain patterns to this, you know, and if you can recognize this, you can immediately then say, okay, here's a strategy that we need to formulate in response to that, okay? So again, here it's, uh, you know, it's again, uh, you know, uh, an attempt on our part to make things very practical, to take tools, uh, to take concepts that are actually very relevant for this kind of work and make them quite practical for you, all right? So we're going to start with, so Kavi, how do we do this? My, <laughs> Gabby knows how to do this. I don't. <laughs> so, we're going to start with a little animation, you know, animated video, which tries to capture all of these concepts, you know. Uh, don't try and kind of absorb everything else, just enjoy the, enjoy the video and then we'll talk about it, okay? Yeah. Hi, I don't think we've met. I am Eli, a small red elevator. I live and work in a four-story building with one apartment on each floor at a time and in a country where trust and cooperation among citizens is at an all-time low. Let me tell you my story. It's sad, yet instructive, and I'm sure you will relate to it, one way or another. 
I was originally designed to lift only two people at a time, but the building residents kept stuffing me with more people than I was made to carry, until the morning that I broke down. I couldn't take it anymore. The cause of my breakdown is a specific collective action problem known as the tragedy of calm. Why did you get out of the cabinet? Let's, let's just use the video of the It's playing on YouTube. I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean. Or it give you the SQ. I have the SQ. No, no, I have the SQ. Oh, I don't know. Hi. I don't think we've met. I am Eli, a small red elevator. I live and work in a four-story building with one apartment on each floor at a time and in a country where trust and cooperation among citizens is at an all-time low. Let me tell you my story. It's sad, yet instructive, and I'm sure you will relate to it, one way or another. I was originally designed to lift only two people at a time, but the building residents kept stuffing me with more people than I was made to carry, until the morning that I broke down. I couldn't take it anymore. The cause of my breakdown is a specific collective action problem known as the tragedy of commons. It occurs when several individuals exploit a shared but limited resource, in this case, me. And according to their own short-term interest, they eventually cause the depletion of the resource, even if doing so is not in everyone's long-term interest. Now let me tell you how the residents eventually managed to have me fixed. The four residents in my building by the way, don't bother with their names, just call them residents, one, two, three, and four, corresponding to the floor on which each lives. Rarely talk to each other, except for the occasional good morning. So when they had to meet to discuss my case, sure enough, a conflict arose. The residents on the upper floors, residents two, three, and four, all wanted me fixed and fast, but resident one refused to pay to get me fixed. He claimed that he did not use me, and that if the others didn't want to climb several flights of stairs with their groceries anymore, well, they should pay for fixing me and leave him out of it, because it was unfair to make him pay for fixing something he did not use. So, the three other residents went ahead and fixed me, without the help of resident one, and they split the repair expenses among themselves. Of course, another possible outcome could have been that I remained broken. This is what we call a suboptimal equilibrium. It means that although the residents would prefer to have a functioning elevator, they ought to carry their groceries up the stairs rather than get me fixed. Good thing that didn't happen. Now that I was up and running again, resident four caught resident one using me to go down to the lower level garage. He and the others didn't know it, but he sometimes also went up to the roof too. Resident one was literally taking a free ride Free riding occurs when one participates in the consumption of a good or service, but not in its production. The three other residents were upset. They immediately decided to solve the problem of resident one free riding by installing a lock that basically turned me into a private <laughs> available only to those who paid for my repair. Resident one was not given a key. That was one way to solve the problem, prevent the free rider from using it. If you want my honest elevator opinion, they could have resorted to a couple of other less drastic ways to resolve this free rider problem. For example, informal sanctions, such as staring at resident one, or not talking to him anymore, could have been tried. Bundling is another way of resolving the free rider problem. Resident one, just like the three others, was duly paying his share for the upkeep of the building's common areas. The three other residents could have devised a way by which all common area services, cleaning, lighting, mowing, and my maintenance and repair, were bundled in one single package. All these services expenses would then come and be paid for in a single bill from the same provider. This way, resident one would be left with no other choice than to pay for my repair, unless of course he wanted to forego all the other services as well, which he used and really cared for. Still, keys were what the residents opted for. They drilled a hole and put in a lock to prevent resident one from using me. However, one day, resident four misplaced his key, so he suggested that a spare key be made and given to the guard for such emergencies. 
Little did the residents know that the guard was buddies with resident one, who managed to use the spare key whenever he wanted, in exchange for a regular tip, provided he told no one about this arrangement. The guard was engaging in what is called rent extraction. At the same time, the guard was creating information asymmetries between him and the other residents, who did not know that he was sharing the spare key with resident one. He had an interest in not disclosing this information because of the rents he was extracting out from resident one. Between you and me, resident one would have been better off paying his share of my initial repair expense. I bet he didn't want to lose face by going back to the other residents and admitting he was wrong. Oh well, he brought this problem upon himself, and I am not going to feel sorry for him. One day, resident two saw the guard give resident one the spare key, and he confronted them. He threatened to have the guard fired, and to report resident one to the others, and even to the building owner. Resident one was so worried and scared that he promised to pay his overdue share in fixing me if Resident 2 did not tell him. Resident 2 now had the leverage, the credibility, and the convening power to organize a small get-together where he was in a position to set the agenda. All the residents met, and a humbled Resident 1 dutifully paid his outstanding contribution to my repair. Agenda setting refers to strategically shaping discussions to attain a desired outcome. So that this situation does not repeat itself in the future, the other residents took advantage of this win to request that a contract be written in which each building resident would be legally bound to repair me if I were ever to break again. Resident 1 agreed and signed the contract like all the others. This contract was a way for all to make a credible commitment to covering the cost of any future repairs. A credible commitment is an arrangement among individuals in which each one refrains from gainful behavior through adopting strong institutions, that is, established practice, recognized by all the relevant actors that tie one's hands from breaking out of future commitments. It's a good solution to a collective action problem. Now that all is well, let me recap. The residents in my building faced a set of incentive problems which festered for several years and prevented them from solving the broader collective action problems they were facing, which in this case meant getting the elevator, me, fixed. Collective action problems occur when the incentives and motivations of individuals run counter to what is good for the group. We looked at these incentive problems one by one and found various ways in which they could be resolved. You could think of me, the elevator, as a metaphor for a common pool resource, with everyone in the building using me, yet I don't belong to anyone in particular, and I am exhaustible or breakable. Examples of other common pool resources include groundwater basins, lakes, irrigation systems, fisheries, forests, the environment, etc. You could think of the building residents as your stakeholders different preferences and incentives, and you should think of the incentive problems I have described as the problems various stakeholders face when trying to solve a problem of common interest, push for a reform, change a law, or agree on the location of a school or a bus stop. Now I need to go back to work and take the four residents, who are now all good friends, for a ride to the terrace. I hope I don't break down again. Wish me luck, or you're on for another video. <laughs> Okay, all right. Uh, so you don't have to remember all of these. I'm going to start, go through uh, them one by one. But uh, let me just start with this. Hi. How many? I don't think we've met. Hi. Enough of the little red elephant. Eli just wants to go on and on. Okay, come on, Eli. All right. How many? How many people are involved in this? Five. Five. Right. Including the guard. Right? Okay. How big a place is this? Yeah, yeah, so, you know, just a building, right? Okay. Yeah. And how many problems did we see emerge in this little place with this white people? Countless. Countless collective action type problems, right? Now, if in a situation like this, you know, you encounter this number of problems, can you imagine, you know, what you would confront in an actual reform process? You are likely to encounter 
all of this at some point in time. Think about it, right? And these are all, you know, sort of, uh, you know, issues that are, and, 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 and constraints that actually you have to deal with in order to get people to work together, right? So what I'd like to do now is to sort of just go through each of this in a somewhat uh, a more detailed way, but also kind of interesting way, okay? I'm not going to jar your brains with mathematics or anything like that. It's, uh, you know, I, I, I used to do a lot of, I, I started my career as a mathematical economist and I figured out very quickly that, you know, that was very interesting in terms of just, you know, what intellectual stimulation, whatever that is. But in the end, when you're really working the ground, you can forget all those equations or whatnot. What matters is really understanding what, what the guys are Ed is a reformed economist. <laughs> Yes. Okay. All right. Let's. Uh, okay. So let's start with the free rider. Huh? Okay. All right. What are these folks doing? So 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 they're trying to build a bridge, right? What is that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't know what that is. But okay. <laughs> what are these guys doing? Shamila to the rescue. <laughs> okay? All right. This fox, okay, this thing is going to get built. Whatever it is, they're going to be able to build that, whatever. It's a bridge or a ramp or whatever. Uh, all of them are going to get paid, right? Their salaries. But what are these guys? They're free riding. They're free riding. They're going to get paid anyway. They're not doing the work. And it's, it's yeah, hey, you know. And there are a lot of people like that you know, in this world, right? That's free riding, right? You know, off the sweat of others. You get, you get the benefit, right? But you don't contribute to you know the production or the, the sweat that's needed. Right? Yeah, click again. That, that's the essence of free riding. We can't see it. What? Who's the free rider? We can't see it. Those two guys, see? Their oh, hands, okay. Your hands aren't there. That, that's why it's in white, you know? Oh, okay. Yeah? Okay. All right, now. All right, now. Let me flash this picture. All right. What is this around? What, what, what are these things? Uh, mm -hmm. They're not called mm -hmm. the IT person. We don't know why the person is. point. Someone wants, wants to chat with you. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> Maybe it's Sanjay. <laughs> OK. Uh, so anyway, what, what is this here? <laughs> the bus is on. There's a red light. Ah, OK, this. Uh, <laughs> I'll fix it. Ah, <laughs> Chief Minister. <laughs> if you if you're if you're not uh, you know uh, familiar with it, Andhra Pradesh is very well known for you know incorporating IT into a lot of its governance work. You know so. Okay now, all right. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Wait, this is what you call collaborative problem solving, right? <laughs> all right. Let's okay. hope it works. <laughs> all right. So, okay. All right. <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> anyway, you saw that. You saw the pictures, right? The, those are things on what? What are they? What are they using? Roads. Roads. Okay. Now, uh, let's say city, city streets, right? Yes. Right? Okay. Uh, how is this funded? Taxes. With taxes, okay? Right, now, tell me, you know, how many people like to pay taxes? No. None, right? So, oh, some. there are some, yeah, but, but the, there's a resistance on the part of many, many individuals that might not want to pay taxes, right? And there's actually serious problems when people actually pay taxes, right? Now, Think about tax evasion, right? Uh, people who avoid paying taxes or don't pay the full amount of taxes, what are they doing? They also enjoy the roads, right? Yeah? And, and But then, you know, they don't pay their fair share, so what are they doing? Free riding. They are free riding, okay? So tax evasion of some sort is a form of free riding. Okay? All right. 
in fact, it's a very pernicious form of free riding because it's very subtle. You know? Now, let me take you now to the kind of work we do, right? In terms of mobilizing thoughts, right? Now, you're all familiar with the National Rifle Association, right? NRA, right? It's a very well organized group, right? Now, uh, they have been very successful at actually keeping regulations and policies from constraining their benefits or their ability to sell firearms, right? Very, very effective. But we all know there's 300, 200 million people in this country, you know, <coughs> who don't particularly like this idea of having to, you know, firearms all over the place. And yet, somehow or another, you know, haven't been able to kind of contest the NRA very effectively. Okay, what's what's the challenge on their part? It's beginning to, it's beginning to, uh, uh, you know, the people are beginning to sort of address it, but it's been taking a long time. What has been their challenge? If you try and challenge the Constitution, you're kind of portrayed as being anti-American. Yeah, but I mean, in terms of just, that's true. But in terms of, uh, you know, organizing, you know, against the NRA. So obviously, if you want to compete on, on the policy, you know, uh, uh, area, you always obviously need to be able to sort of organize. Uh, I, right? I think the NRA has been very successful in setting the agenda and uh, setting the narrative uh, of the issue not being about gun control per se, but more of a constitutional Right. Okay. Now, what? Why have they been able to do that? What? Uh, yeah. Basically, because they've solved their collective action problem, right? They are very well organized, right? Whereas the rest of the population has had difficulty in actually organizing to contest, you know, the position of the NRA, right? Now, how does the NRA actually manage to do this? By, by, um... How have they managed to organize? There's about a million members, I understand. Because they put they put the issue as, as yes. gun control, not as an issue of you know responsibility and safety, but, but as a much control. higher level of what is America. America is a place no. where individuals... Okay. That, that's very good. That's, that's the issue. But in terms of mean? just being able to organize, yeah, well, they've organized around how, how have they been able to get those one million members to actually just you know become members and stay as members? They rallied around the myth. Well, I mean, you know, if I were, if I were, for instance, uh, you know, think about free riding, right? I own a gun or whatnot, you know. Well, well, why don't I just let the others do it? You know, I'll benefit from it anyway, right? Right? I mean, you know, look, let them do the lobbying, let them do it, let them do the work, and if they succeed, I'll benefit anyway, right? So how how do you think they've been able to solve that problem? Imagine, you're, you're, these are one million people, right? Okay, what are the incentives? Actually, it's a little on the Eli of it, uh, video. Playing on fears. What's that? Playing on that fear. Uh, Part of it is that. Creating a fund, maybe giving discounts on guns. And, uh, okay, you're getting much closer. Very practical ways of doing it, yeah? They bundle, they bundle things, okay? There's a, there's a fee for becoming, a, there's a membership fee, annual membership fee, which they have to pay which is quite substantial, but in return they get discounts on all sorts of guns, bullets, and all that, which, they, which the uh, NRA organizes with, with, the, uh, with the suppliers and all that. So if you were basically uh, you know, a, 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 a gun lover or whatnot, well, why don't I kind of join? And I may, be, uh, you know, I may not necessarily agree with the NRA all the time, but heck, you know, I've got the, I, <laughs> I can get a discount on bullets, I can get a discount on guns, I let to collect guns, you know, I, I'll, I'll pay this fee, right, in order to be able to do that. And, you know, the fees then uh, enable the NRA to do a lot of, you know, lobbying, right? This is bundling. You know, you're bundling the, the, the private, you know, the, the, the private good aspect, you know, with the sort of the collective good aspect, right? And so the challenge for, for us, for the rest of the population, is that, you know, you somehow you need to develop those kinds of, you know, practical, you know, uh, methods for organizing. Otherwise, it's very hard. I mean, uh, you know, just organizing 10,000 people is a, is a challenge. Imagine trying to organize 20 million people, 
right? So okay, so that's why free riding is essential, right? So so if if what you recognize as you're kind of going through this reform process that you're kind of supporting, that perhaps with one particular group, you know, which should actually be organized, you know, but isn't organized, it's a large group, chances are the problem is free riding, and strategic communication can actually help address the free riding problem. Okay, and I think, you know, uh, Gabby and, and, and uh, I think uh, uh, C level, Gabby certainly will have, you know, examples of how that can be done. Okay, yeah. Just um, as an example, I think tax evasion is perhaps more uh, prevalent in countries where the uh, tax collection system and the whole taxation system is not very developed because there it becomes an issue of whether you need, uh, whether you want to contribute to a road or not. Whereas to use Denmark as an example, we pay a lot of taxes, around over 50% in many cases. Yeah. Uh, but what you get is the bundle of mm -hmm. services ranging from free education mm -hmm. through your lifetime and uh, social safety net, free uh, medical services, and so on. So you, you cannot really say you don't want that. Yeah. You know? well Part of it too is the socialization process, right? I mean, you get socialized into this, yeah, which is yeah, part no. of communication, yeah, so right? I mean, there's a role for communication in this whole process, and and I bet from 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 day one you were born or whatnot, you're already socialized into this milieu that you know what you get is X Y Z W A B C, right? With and the taxes you pay. We love paying taxes, yeah. but there's a high level of accept of the system, and it's part of being. Different. And it works. You yeah. actually get what you what you pay for, yeah. right? But the the, the culture on it is a solidarity, yeah. which you get from. The, yeah, well, that's why. That's all. I mean, you socialize the, yeah. you're socialized into it. Okay. All right. So that's the free rider problem. Okay. It's very real. Right. Uh, and a lot. I mean, a lot of the problem sometimes in collective action is about that. Right. Yeah? In fact, you know, we have a tool. I don't know. I, I don't. Maybe you, at some point in time, you know, uh, you're doing the stakeholder analysis, right? I mean, anyway, if, you know, we have a tool where basically we map, uh, you know, on. On, on, on one axis, you know, the, the, the position of uh, different groups, right? And on the vertical axis, you know, the relative influence, you know? And you can do that very systematically, right? If you actually see a group where the, the influence, is, uh, the, 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 the size, the position in, in, is, is very much in support of uh, your efforts, you know? And it's a large group. You can you can you can uh, you can actually uh, indicate the size of the group by the by the size of a circle. The larger the circle, the larger the group, right? So here's a pattern. If you do that, right? Maybe I should draw it. Should I draw yeah, it? Please. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we actually there's a way of doing it. I don't know. Maybe some part of, of this uh, program you will. But we do have a, a tool that actually helps us do that. You know, help, helps. A team actually do that, you know? uh, but anyway, you know, if you have something like this, right? Okay, and you have here uh, the position, right? You know, uh, which is four is here, right? Against is there, right? And then here you have influence. Yeah. Actually, you don't need this. It's just uh, yeah. zero influence, and the higher, the more influence. Right? If you if you start aligning your groups, you know, one group for instance could be somewhere here, very much in support of your reform, right? And uh, but its influence is somewhat very low, right? But its size is that much, you know, the size of circle. And then you have uh, another group which is you know very much opposed to you, right? And then but then the influence is here, but the size is like that. And you can do this for different groups, but when you see a pattern like this, for instance, this stark case, this is probably a free rider problem. These guys aren't able to organize, you know, despite the fact that there's large numbers of them, that, you know, they support it, but somehow their influence is muted, okay? So this is what I mean by patterns, and there are tools for actually, you kind of, you know, recognizing these patterns, okay? All right, so let's move on to the next, to the next thing. Uh, uh, is it clear? 
Is it something that the politicians make use of? For example, when they want to mobilize the minorities for getting votes, they were in very large numbers perhaps, but they are not able to organize uh, they probably do something similar, yeah. Uh, uh, which is why, you know, let's put it this way, okay? You always assume that whoever's on the other side is is acting strategically, right? And so, if you don't act strategically, you're dead. So you might, might as well you need the tools, the skills to be able to respond strategically. And if you you actually act strategically and they don't, then you have the edge. So whatever it is, you need to be strategic in the way you kind of respond to this. Okay, what, I, what we're trying to give you are, are tools in which you can actually do this effectively, or more effectively. Okay? Alright, shall we move on to the next one? Okay. Alright. So next, where is my clicker? Okay. Alright, uh, the next one, okay. So yeah, I use UPay. Okay, I mean that's the one way to remember the free rider problem. Okay? All right, the next one. Okay, what does this look like? It is very typical, especially in big cities. Right? So you have the, okay. Anyway, it's almost, you have this. He's the owner of the house, and here's the tax man, right? At least in this cartoon, he's putting up a facade and says his house is only worth this much. Right? But this house is actually worth that much. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's really that's the value. A lot of this happens yeah. in big cities. Alright? Now, the, the challenge here is is what's called a, 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 a the problem here is what's called an asymmetry of information. Alright? You, the owner of the house, have a very good idea of how much your house is worth. Because you have an interest in that, right? Right? The tax man, you got, in many places, particularly in many of our client countries where the, you know, where, where the registries are not well developed or whatnot, the tax man, poor tax man, you know, they have to guess these things, you know? It's not clear to them, you know? They don't even know probably, you know, where the street is or what, you know? It, th there's a high transactions cost for the tax man to actually try and pin down the actual cost of the value of the house, right? So there's an asymmetry of information. The taxman has a very vague idea of what it, you know, the value of the house. You know, you know, the value of the house, right? And so when you declare your tax, you say, well, it's only worth this much. The taxman, well, is it maybe yes, maybe not, right? And what happens is that you're able to declare the value of your house as much lower than it actually is. Okay, All right. And this is, uh, I, I tell you, this is a real problem for many mayors. Yeah? in many big cities, in even small cities, but more so in big cities, okay? And it's been, it's been a problem that, you know, it's, 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 it's continuous to this day, it's time immemorial, actually. All right, so, so there's an asymmetry of information. How would you actually try and solve this problem? Yeah. You get some uh, objective expert to assess the value. Yeah, which uh, some countries so have. You, you, um, Provide more information to let them out being a citizen. Uh, okay, how would you do that? Sanctions, fresh. Well, you know, it may have to add the all these things. Sanctions, it's like the guy's going to get fined if they get You back. make it mandatory you have a, a independent institution to assess value. Uh, okay. If there's a transaction or not. All right. That's one way to do it. Very costly, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The cost of doing it, you're going to have to. Have you know, uh, independent auditors or whatever who have the capability to do that, right? So it's it's an additional cost. Sure, you can do it. That's one alternative. But you know, the fact that many mayors don't do it suggests that it's probably a very costly alternative. Right? Remember, if you've got if you've got maybe five hundred thousand million houses in your, you know, the cost of doing that could be quite prohibitive. I don't know what it's like. In the US, but I remember there's the public institution that uh, makes an annual assessment of the value of property. Oh, well, and so in that's fact, a, a guiding rod. It's not necessarily the truth, but it gives sure. some measure. In, in, in many developed countries, in fact, you do have that sort of a, a distribution of rates. If you're in this neighborhood, it's about this much, that sort of thing, right? Many of our client countries, you don't have that. 
right? So the poor mayor just kind of has to develop his own kind of clever way of actually getting at this. And I can tell you there are clever ways of doing this, you know. At least I know at least one clever way of, of getting at this issue, you yeah? uh, And uh, uh, anyway, uh, uh, we had the privilege of actually uh, hosting, um, you know, uh, Mayor Peña Losa from uh, Bogota, you know, who's uh, well known for actually introducing fairly drastic reforms in Bogota and helping turn it around into a really, uh, you know, a, you know a first, close first, close first rate city. Okay, uh, and and so you know, um, what he did was something like this. He said, "Okay, because I, I can't hire others. I can't, you know, it's just too expensive, right?" So. Well, I did. I said, "All right." They, they issued a municipal decree that was that was something to the like this, right? Uh, the municipal, the city government, okay, you know, uh, has uh, the right and the authority. It actually did have that, but the right to actually purchase your house at your at your self-assessed value. <laughs> Simple, yeah. Guess what happened? Everybody started raising the vows, right? Okay, maybe not to the full vow, but at least it started raising it. Okay, and so that's how basically he solved the asymmetric information problem. You create incentives so that the person who actually has the information has the incentive to reveal the information. Okay, okay. Now there are a variety of ways of dealing with asymmetric information, and I think this is where actually strategic communication can be particularly important. Uh, let me uh, uh, give, uh, move us again back to our realm of trying to get different groups to work together. Okay? And I'll give an example of this in tomorrow when we do the procurement reform case. But a lot of times, you know, the reason why the majority you know, of people don't somehow respond, you know, to what obviously are deleterious, you know, policies a deleterious policy for the community or the site as a whole is because they don't really understand things. They don't understand how things work. Right? That's an asymmetric information. The vested interests, you know, were actually keeping the policy environment in their favor, right? They understand that system in and out. That's why they managed to do it. Right? But the rest of us, well, we got our the regular, you know, lives and all that. We don't have the time to try and understand that. So we don't, we don't really understand that stuff. And therefore, because we don't understand it, we just okay, well, you know, we just don't respond. Okay, that's asymmetry of information, and communications has a big role to play in that, in enabling people to basically understand, you know, what the issues are really all about. And you have to do it probably in different ways for different audiences. All right. So, any questions on that? All right. Okay. Now, asymmetric information is a very difficult concept in economics, but I hope I've uh, been able to communicate its essence. Yeah. Okay. The next thing we're going to do. So, let me end with this. Okay. So that's how to remember asymmetric information. I know he doesn't. I gain. Okay. Whenever we negotiate. <laughs> Okay. All right. Now, let's play a little. Let's not a little game, but uh, somewhat of a little game. You know, uh, it's agenda setting. Actually, it's more like agenda control. Okay, which is very important. Yeah, if you're trying to move a reform forward. Okay. Now, this is a situation where we have three individuals who are at a, a, a nice restaurant. Yeah, uh, Alex, Bob, and Chip. You know, and then that you know, finished their main meal, and they would like dessert. But they only have enough money for one dessert. Right, just one, right? Okay, and here's how the, uh, their preferences line up, okay? Mm -hmm. So Alex likes, you know, pie. So this, that's why you have the three people. Ah, that's, that's, that's my most favorite kind of option. Then a sundae. And then a chocolate chip, a large chocolate chip cookie. Okay. For Bob, it's a different kind. I Bob's. I know. I like. I like the Sunday better. More best, right? And then the chocolate chip cookie, and then the pie, right? Now Chip, 
Just now, my favorite is the chocolate chip cookie, cookie, the pie, and then the sundae. All right. Now, what they've agreed to is okay. We're gonna vote on this. <laughs> Two states voting, right? Pairwise voting. So, you know, one option against another option, and whoever wins then goes gets paired with the third one. And the single voting rule, majority rules. So two out of three need to vote. Okay? All right. Now, so okay. Remember that? Those are the those are the uh, yeah. <laughs> those are the preferences. So let's do this. Think of this agenda one. Okay? Agenda one is the pie against the uh, Sunday. Whoever wins there is, uh, you know, it gets pitted against the chocolate chip cookie. Okay? Again, now look at the preferences here. Okay? Right. So, what will be the outcome if this were the agenda? What would the three eventually agree on? So, okay, let's see. With the pie against uh, the, the, the Sunday, Alex prefers the pie against Sunday, right? Uh, but Bob prefers the Sunday to the pie. Uh, Chip prefers the, the pie to the Sunday. So it'll be the, the, the pie that wins, right? Yeah. Okay? Now, if, now, so it will be the pie against the cookie, right? So if it's the pie against the cookie, Alex likes the pie, the cookie, but both Chip and, and Bob prefer the cookie to the pie, right? And so what will end up is the cookie, right? And you can go to the same exercise. Agenda two would be something like this, yeah? And what will win out is the pie, right? And agenda three would be this, and what would win out is the Sunday. Okay. Now, both, let, both Bob and Chips, okay, Alex, you know, you, know you, you decide what the agenda is. Okay, and we'll just vote on it. So if you were Alex, what would you choose? What? Huh? Agenda two, right? You would set it this way. You would control the agenda say that because that's what you want. Okay? All right. Now, this is what's called agenda say or agenda control. This is a classic example of agenda control. Now, the two things that are important here for you to be able to do this, okay, for, for this to happen. One, you must have a good sense of what the preferences of all the other stakeholders or players are. Know, know the preferences, okay? Second, know the rules of the game. Again, I'll give a very good example of this tomorrow. So knowing both, if you have you know, the preferences and the rules of the game, yeah, you will be able to control the agenda, all right? Now, the important thing about this is that, you know, the other side, whoever you know, is against you or whatever doesn't like what you're doing, right? is probably going to be trying to do this as well. So you can bet your life, if you're not doing this and they're doing it, you're going to kind of lose out. Yeah. All right? Okay, now, this is, I can tell you, this is not an easy concept. I mean, this, uh, uh, this comes out of, uh, uh, um, a Nobel Prize uh, economist, you know, uh, uh, not the, not Samuelson, Samuelson. Arrow, Kenneth Arrow. Arrow's impossible to be here. Comes out of that, you know? Very complex. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. It's basically game theory, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but we're trying to simplify, and this is the essence of it. Okay? Yeah. I was saying that we have also a combination of theories. Something like this. Yes, yeah. Yeah, that's why I wanted to be a little careful. I mean, I, I should have said agenda control, actually. It's a little different in communications, but they are linked. They are related. Huh? Okay, so that's another, that's another kind of instrument uh, available to you. Okay? All right. So, remember this. If you maneuver, you win. They maneuver, you don't maneuver, you lose. What's this? I <laughs> well, I had manipulate there uh, earlier, and my, my team said, that's not a good word to use. I <laughs> used it yesterday. <laughs> yeah, I actually like the word manipulate, right? Yeah. But hey, look, I mean, think of it, you know, you're actually fighting a war, right? 
Think about it that way. See, a lot of times we think about reform as sort of like we're trying to do something good, right? But when you think about it, because you're dealing with politics, you know, it's like fighting a war. It's like fighting a battle. So, and you've got to approach it in the, from that perspective. Because if you don't approach it from that perspective, you know, you, you lose. Right? Okay. All right. All right. This, okay. Trust in the prisoner's dilemma. i got to go to a video, uh, to a, a YouTube video here. This, this one. Golden Bulls. After a run of big cash balls, Ibrahim and Nick now have 13,600 pounds in front of them. We know they've got it, but the golden question is, can they keep it? Ibrahim and Nick, you now face a very straightforward choice, but it's a choice that could make one or both of you extra wealthy, but it could also lose both of you everything that you have fought for today. They have to decide to split or steal. <laughs> Ibrahim, Nick, you have two final golden balls in front of you, and they are the most important golden balls of the game. You each have a golden ball with the word split written inside. You both have a ball with the word steal written inside. You will know which is split, which is steel, because you can have a look. If you both pick the split ball, you split the 13,600, and you go home with 6,800 each. If one of you chooses the steel ball, and the other chooses the split ball, whoever chooses the steel ball goes home with the whole lot, 13,600. But if you both use the steel ball, you leave today's game with what you came with. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it's the ultimate test of faith, trust, and let's face it, greed. Take a moment to look at the balls in front of you so you know for definite which is split and which is steel. But obviously, keep them concealed from each other. Just have a look.
The only way you can guarantee to walk away with 6,800 is by sharing. to guarantee that you both put the split ball in. And I do now have to push you for a decision. It's a tough one. We've lost it. We've lost everything. Well, sir, we're walking away with no money because you're an idiot. This can go on all night, and these people are going to get up for breakfast. <laughs> choose split or steal. Abraham, choose split or steal. Now, <laughs> choose a ball. Right, well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to go with you. Okay. I'm going to go with you. I promise you, I'm going to You cannot change your balls now. Split or steal? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Congratulations, you're both split and each received 6,800 pounds. Okay, this is not going to be Okay. What's the moral of this uh, of this uh, video? Okay, you're better off compromising than. <laughs> well, I mean, let's uh, let's put this way. Let, let me show you uh, the next. Uh, okay. You know, there's a there's a classic problem in game theory or microeconomics called the prisoner's dilemma. Right, and I've just kind of replicated a matrix that represents a prisoner's dilemma. And the, and the prisoner's dilemma is very simple. You know, you have Two kind of potential, whatever, uh, you know, what they call suspects, right? Police get them, they put them in separate cells, they, they have no way of communicating, you know? Cells are different sides of the, 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 you know, the, the police station, right? And, and, and they are each kind of questioned by, you know, respective detectives, right? And, and their choices are either squeal in the other or, or not. In this case, example of either choose split or choose steal. Right? Split or steal. Okay? Again here, the important thing in prisoner's dilemma, there's no communication. There is no way for the two to communicate. Right? So keep that in mind. Let's analyze this, okay? You know. So if you were Abraham, okay, I have no way of communicating with Nick. I don't know how he's going to, you know. Uh, uh, decide. So uh, let's look at uh, his uh, his decision calculus here. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm just going to use. I'm just going to point to it. Okay. Uh, so if if Nick chooses split, right? What's the best choice for Abraham? Split. I mean, the, the first uh, payoff here, the blue one is Abraham's. What he will get in the the green is what Nick will get, right? So right, if if, if Nick choose a split, you know, then for Abraham he should actually choose steel, right? Right? Now if Nick chooses steel, you know, what should Abraham do? Either split or steal, but right? He gets zero either way, right? In this case, he might as well just choose steel, right? Regardless of what Nick does. He might always just to you know choose steel, right? Okay, right? And you know by symmetry, Nick does the same thing. He might as well also just choose steel, right? Remember they can't communicate, right? So they're kind of analyzing this on their own, right? And so what's the result? They both end up with nothing, nothing right? Okay, but we saw in that video, right, in that game, they actually split, right? It's actually a very popular game, and, and you know, one of my research, uh, one of my colleagues actually did some research on it, and and and, and uh, 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 the, uh, of all the games that were played, about a third, you know, uh, they split. A third, there was uh, a steal and, and a split, and about a third, basically, they both chose steal, right? So, so there's possibilities of actually getting to the split, yeah, both splits, right? Okay, now. Let's look at uh, Nick's strategy here. Now, in this case, in the video, they were able to communicate. There, yeah, maybe half, uh, you know, half a minute, maybe a minute, but they could communicate, right? What was Nick's strategy? Well, it was something like this. 
right? It, basically, Nick was saying, I'm going to be here. I don't care what you choose, I'm going to steal. And I'm telling you, I'm going to steal. But I promise you that if you choose split, I'll split the thing half and half with you. Right? So if you were Abraham and you could see he was already kind of yeah, frustrated, aggravated, or whatever, what am I going to do, right? You know? But if you were actually Abraham, at least if I were Abraham, I'd say, well, you know, if I choose steel, I'm certain to get zero. If I choose split, well, maybe he might, you know, um, uh, you know, so there's a probability that I might get actually half. So what would you select? Split, right? So what made the difference here? The communication. Nick was able to communicate. He's a smart guy. He probably looked at, you know, past games and sort of figured, this is, this is what I'm going to do. Okay? All right. So, uh, and, and, and so l let me then... Uh, 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 sort of, uh, uh, sort of, well, okay. Uh, the whole issue behind that, uh, this, 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 this kind of this problem is that you know there is a need for trust amongst different players, right? In a prisoner's dilemma, you know, there's no trust there. Beginning, right? In order to develop trust, there has to be some form of communication, right? Now, I mean. This is one representation of what, what trust looks like in work relationships, you know, uh, and it really requires that you know somehow individual has the competence to to do what he says he can do, right? Cares about others, right? And has some credibility, right? I mean, these are kind of the three things that go into trust, right? But see, you know, competence maybe you can judge from. You know, you know, and maybe his CV or whatever, right? But this too takes a little time, right? I mean, it takes time to actually assess that. So really, as the, you know, for trust to emerge, it requires time and repeated interaction. That's what's required for trust to actually evolve. You don't develop trust immediately. You've got to be able to learn about the others, and it usually comes in sort of engagement. So, the implication for, and again I'll give an example uh, uh, tomorrow, is that in situations as you're trying to mobilize, you know, you need to think about how uh, structured ways in which you can have repeated uh, uh, interactions, uh, 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 which actually have a goal. You know, it's not just, you know, let's go together for lunch or whatnot, but, you know, you're working towards a goal. Okay? And, and, and so we'll, we'll you know, we'll, Discuss it. Yeah, go ahead. Don't you think there's also the issue of investment? Because if, yeah, yeah. if the stakes have been half a million, a million dollars yeah, or a million yeah. pounds, because 6,800 pounds is not that much. Yeah, yeah. Um, and if you know, if you they, they came with nothing, they're leaving with nothing, okay, it's 6,000 pounds. If it's half a million dollars, do you think they would have chosen different? In options? fact, the, that's what the data says. So basically, the larger it is, if it uh, certain beyond a certain level, a lot of people choose steel. No. Uh, because, I mean, it, it, there's a calculus there, right? You know, so, so you have to kind of take this thing. But nevertheless, you know, what, what it does say is that, you know, I mean, then you have to probably address it in a different, you know, in a different way in terms of communicating, you know. <laughs> but uh, the important thing is that, you know, with communication, you at least create, you know, the possibility of collaboration, you know, of, of being able to work together. Without it, not, you know. You'll, you end up in the you know in the pits, okay? Now, but but again, you know, uh, uh, important to that is the building of trust, yeah. And actually, you know, the reason it needs you know time and repeated interaction is because, you know, if people need to see that on the other side, that individual is willing to invest the time, you know, in this effort. If I can see that they are willing to invest the time, okay, then that creates more of a. Yeah, it enables me to trust that that group of this, that individual one, okay? Because there's a cost to him or her after that investment, you know, not to basically yeah, uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, basically, uh, you know, uh, what do you call this, uh, live up to his or her commitments, okay? Which gives me to a related point, which is credible commitment. You know, we saw this in the, in the red elevator. And, and, and really, the easiest way to think about credible commitment is another one of those uh, 
concepts in, in gay theory and microeconomics. Uh, uh, it's really a, a mechanism that makes it costly for uh, an individual who commits to something to actually renege. If I renege, there's a huge cost to me. So my incentive is basically not to renege. That's the idea of a credible commitment. Okay? And sometimes it's, it, you know, doesn't have to be monetary. It could be reputational. Right? Okay, so, so uh, now, uh, the reason you have contracts, right? A contract is a, is a, is a sort of a, a, is a very effective, a credible commitment mechanism. Right? Because if I violate the terms of the contract, <laughs> I could get sued, I can mean, I, you know, there's a cost to me, right? That's easy enough to understand. But in many situations, you know, there's, you know, you don't have access to contracts, right? I mean, let me give an example in, you know, uh, uh, in, in the Philippines, for instance, that, you know, we have a large you know, uh, Chinese community, you know? Um, uh, certainly, the, this was true in the 60s, it's probably not as true anymore today because it's, it's much, the community is much larger. So. Uh, in the 50s and the 60s, there's just emerging, you know, uh, yeah, a Chinese business community. So if you were a, a, a Chinese uh, immigrant, you know, uh, one, a Chinese wanting to migrate to the Philippines, right, and to get started, you know, uh, uh, you won't be able to get money from the, the banks or what because they'll say you're Chinese. Really. Yeah, there's that discrimination. So where would they get the money? It's actually from the local Chinese, you know, uh, community, right? Uh, but then you have to be introduced by someone in the community to individuals, right? And then, of course, the individuals say, okay, here's money. No contracts, nothing, right? Okay, but what that means is that you better live up, you know, to your whatever commitments of paying back. Because guess what happens if you don't? You're parried, you're essentially expelled. There's no way you can get support from that community. If you can't get support from that community, you can't get support from the rest of society, what happens to you? You go back or something like that. There's a cost. There's a huge cost to that. So there's a form of a credible commitment in that. In that, in that. Okay? Yes. Yeah. It's like what you have in Africa. Most of my friends would know uh, what you call susu. susu uh -huh. yeah. Africa. It's the same principle. It's a group of women. Usually they don't have access to money, funding mm -hmm. from the bank. Mm -hmm. And they get together. And every week or every month, depending on the groups, each one contributes. So it's just based on trust. Yeah. So every month, all the money is put together and given to one person. If you don't pay, it's your reputation in the community. Yeah. Yeah. So there is a big exactly. you know, trust element. To it. So there's a reputational cost, right? Now, over the, see, the, thing is, the reason this is important is because a lot of situations, you start where there's no trust. So you need some kind of a mechanism to begin the interaction, right? And this is one way to do it. Over time, as you interact or whatnot, you know, the mechanism may not even be needed anymore, right? But somehow or another, you need to start someplace, right? Yes. I'd like to offer another perspective on this. I'll go back to um, uh, the Dean uh, presentation yesterday, in talk about social trust. Yeah. And um, again, probably, again, the part of Nigeria, where you have uh, culture of uh, distrust, a very uh, high trust deficit mm -hmm. in both public and private and, you know, interactions. Uh, so you have that that is built into the system over you know, the last 50 years. You also have, as you said, the, the price for building trust and credible commitment in some places is uh, this would be reputational damage. Mm -hmm. Well, I make the argument that there's no such risk in Nigeria. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you have these two uh, empty spaces to fill out where you don't have the transactional trust that is required mm -hmm. to actually complete the transaction. So the cost of the transaction uh, is expensive on the economic sense. So what, what exactly do you do in terms of um, you know um, establishing some basis, I don't know if it's of social trust, something that it's like a promissory note of, of trust as well. Mm -hmm. But I can't give it to you now, but I'm going to give it to you, you know, but without saying trust me, I'm going to give it to you. Yeah. Is, is there a third Yeah, there's a, well, I mean, you have to be creative, but you, you, what, you, what you've actually explained is, is, is what's known as a timing consistency problem, right? Mm -hmm. Because 
I can I can say, okay, let's get into a deal now, you know, and I'll pay you later. I promise I'll pay you later, you know. But then later it comes, you know, well, you know, I don't necessarily need to pay you, right? I mean, that probably happens a lot in, in Nigeria, right? So that's why all, you know, and, and when, when people start behaving that way, what happens is that the, 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 the whole environment is one of distrust. There's no longer any social trust. Right? So building that is going to be difficult, but you know, you have, just have to be creative a little, a little at a time, you know, uh, with uh, small communities probably. Starting with small communities as opposed to, you know, the whole community. I mean, that's the only way to do it. I mean, uh, uh, and then I, I can't tell you how to do it in your, in your community, but I can tell you what the concept is, you know? And how you actually uh, concretize that, you know, is up to, to your creative juices. And my God, you know, I think Nigerians are some of the most creative uh, uh, people in the world. You, know, you guys have thought all sorts of different, uh, you know, schemes, right? I'm pretty sure you can come up with <laughs> sorts of schemes and actually how to address this. So you're gonna have to talk about this. Create some positive changes where collective action rewards, rewards the, yeah. those who yeah. participate. Yeah, yeah. So once people start seeing that, mm. maybe it's worth yeah. getting in there. Because right now, the only thing that pays off is being a free rider and yeah. just yeah. looking yeah. after yourself. Yeah. That's why you have to start somehow in some yeah. small slots, but, right? But yeah. Focusing on the incentive, yeah. creating incentives. Yeah. This is all about attract. incentives, in fact. Yeah. In fact, the critical commitment mechanism is about affecting those incentives. You know, helping create the right incentive. Okay? So the important thing is remember what the essence is. Huh? Yeah. Well, uh, okay, I can relate it to the situation which I observed, where there are these schemes of, you know, you pay money and you get some profit. So this guy does it a couple of times and oh. the money keeps on going <laughs> and at the same time. It's a Ponzi scheme. Yeah, it's like this. Uh, uh, the, the, the greatest Ponzi scheme yeah. of all time, Bernie Madoff, right? Mm -hmm. That was a great Ponzi scheme. You know, he he had some of the smartest, some of the richest, some of the whatever you know, most most well known uh, people in the world actually in his in his, in his hands, right? And they didn't realize that he was actually running a very sophisticated, complex Ponzi scheme. I'll ask you a question. Yeah. And, and this is uh, goes back to the show of values. I'm sorry, I yeah. back to this. So no, no, good. Presenting here. Um, in, in that uh, video we watched, the, the uh, compare talked about greed, greed yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. And greed, of course, is tied to incentives and expectations of incentives, and it helps modify your decision making model as well. The question now becomes in a space where you don't have the usual anchors of trust in terms of knowing the person doing the relationship, yeah. right? And you have greed as um, um, as a motivating factor, right? Particularly embedded in that. So how, how do you use, from purely manipulative point of view, greed as, uh, uh, should I say, positive, positive, or negative, positive uh, factor in that equation? And I was just saying, how do you use greed strategically yeah, to make yeah, it behave yeah, in a way? Absolutely. How okay, well, how, how this is where, what I mean, the way you create the credible commitment mechanism is anchored on that. How do I get this guy who's really greedy Gre yeah. to actually, you know, behave in the way that I want him to behave, right? And, you know, the, 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 this is why this is an exciting area because you have to be quite creative. And I think it's very culturally some, somewhat uh, specific, context specific, right? Uh, but at least you know what, what, what needs to be done, okay? Yes? Building on that, I mean, in, in Iraq, you have a situation where uh, years of sanction and war, etc., have eroded social fabric to the point where the Prime Minister has said that there is an acceptable mortality rate mm. beyond which he will then act. Right now, we're going through a situation in Baghdad where hundreds of people have been killed um, through assassinations, through, through mass attacks by various different factions. There is no trust. Militia are riding the streets of Baghdad, picking people off, and bodies are piling up. We're going back to 2006. And um, where you have an election commission that doesn't care, the people don't care, because the vote, you know, who cares who wins? We all know who's going to win at the end of the day. So how do you then deal where you have greed as a factor, but you make a mistake? People are really going to, they're going to play with their lives, with uh -huh. your policy mistake. Mm -hmm. And well, it's going to just ingrain, it, it's actually going to become part of the norm, the cost of doing business is that 
200 people die every week. Well, I mean, there's no easy solution to that. I can't give you any solutions to that. It's a very complex you know, uh, situation. Uh, one thing, one thing that might be worthwhile doing is actually have, uh, you know, have, uh, you know, people have been in uh, 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 countries that have been in similar situations. You know, for instance, you know, uh, you know, Ireland and England for for what decades? For what? Right? You know, how 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 did that finally get resolved? That was pretty violent for for many decades, right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly that example I think shows that you like some political leadership that dares change the norm and set a higher standard that we we're gonna you know change the situation and, and I believe we can and, but without that kind of leadership it's it's it looks pretty bleak right mm -hmm. but I can see other mission than leadership mm -hmm. in this situation because what can the ordinary citizen do mm -hmm. in, in Ireland women actually played a huge role because mothers of those paramilitaries were the ones who said enough is enough mm -hmm. and they must move forward. The problem also in Iran, in Iraq, sorry, is that you know women are trying to take up positions, but um, you you have this creeping marginalization and in mm -hmm. some in some cases actual targeting targeting of women mm -hmm. and the mobilization of religion mm -hmm. against against any kind of collective action and, and leadership is migrating. No, it's going, it's, it's yeah. just enough, it's enough. It's uh, hopelessness, no? So you need At the moment, yeah. 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 Uh, go ahead. I, I, I mean, this, this is like tales from the, uh, from the netherworld, all of this is uh, less than perfect scenarios. But one of the things that, that is clear to me is when you mentioned the island uh, case in Iraq, it's really a function of timing. And you, you know, we, we have all these really neat theories about the way the world works, mm -hmm. the way the, way the world should work. But, you know, in real life, it doesn't really happen like that. There's always that X factor. It's almost like, what was that thing called uh, dynamic equilibrium, where things are always changing. Yeah. 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 But timing is clearly at the heart of it, right? I go back to a place like um, uh, Somalia, now that it's going, you know, it's some kind of a renaissance. Exactly. So it's like street lights and everything else. But it's taking, you know, a quarter of a century to get, there. To, get to the north is enough uh, position. I mean, 25 years ago, all of this wouldn't work either because no, no. people weren't ready. So the question now becomes, you know, the timing, right? Do, do, do states have to literally collapse and get to the point where they necessarily have to rebuild on the ground of all, in a word, as a friend of mine used to say, refound. You know, you, know, you always have this independence narrative where at certain points you found, the, the country is founded on a new independent track, it becomes self sustain and self government. So you always seem, seem as if sometimes, right, all of this stuff has to be, played, it has to be played out. That's what played out. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, but it's a function of timing. I don't know how long, is there some kind of statistical or mathematical mm -hmm. question that says, oh, well, in the next 25 years, this is gonna happen, this is gonna happen. Um, and it's, it's very difficult because these things on the surface have um, a measure of um, uh, possibility. You can look at it and say, wow, it will work. Mm -hmm. but you know, the next factor is it might not work. And it has nothing to do with the um, uh, validity of the theories in practice. Yeah. It's just a function of timing. Exactly. Well, you know, in fact, I, not to mention that, uh, you know, uh, Ronnie Heifetz has, has, uh, you know, has a famous line on this, you know. Um, you see, uh, this is probably a very difficult and adaptive challenge, you know. It's a right? It's a very difficult and adaptive challenge. Yeah. But he says, look, you know, the difference between a technical child problem and an adaptive child is that the technical problem is time bound. You know that it takes you X amount of time and you can solve it. Right? With adaptive child, there's, there's no how it's. We take a week, we take 10 years, mm -hmm. it took 100 years. You know? But what is important, okay, this is what's key, you know? for that challenge to be resolved, everyone who's been affected by that problem needs to come together and basically work on the problem. Mm -hmm. So until you get to that point, you know, you're not going to be able to solve the problem. You know, so that's why timing, I think, is probably you know a, a real uh, you know a real factor in this because you know it takes a while before some of the 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 the, 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 the dots get aligned, right? You know, the stars are aligned, right? Uh, uh, so I mean, uh, I got, that's about as best as I can respond to that, and uh, you know, because uh, I don't think theory can can do any more.
And that it really depends on the individuals, yeah. Just wanted to modify what I said before because it's not just a matter of like uh, established political leadership. I think you unfortunately missed the presentation yesterday on social movements, which was really interesting. And, and that would sort of be the alternative path that, that the leadership comes from the community that sort of gets to the tipping point of enough is enough. And mm -hmm. something has to give. Again, finding the powerful framing message that can mobilize people and change the course. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that is something we're going to talk about in the next session, which is really political dynamics. Mm -hmm. Because all these problems exist, as Sinjo was saying, in a dynamic political situation that's always on the move. And, 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 and being able to spot opportunities in the dynamics uh, is one of the things that uh, we have to be able to do. And we'll talk about that in the next session. Yeah, for me, I think I, I would go back to your drawing there. Uh, here, as we can see, for me, advocacy depends on the numbers. Mm -hmm. But the fact that these people have little influence, if I continue to communicate why we need to act here, people will be aware of the situation they are in, and at the end of the day, the number will be more influential than what we have there, and we can bring it up. Yeah, it's a, certainly, a, a, but it's a challenge. It, it's a challenge, and there are a lot of risks, yeah. especially when you are in a conflict situation like uh, the one that we have in uh, Iraq or Afghanistan. But if you have uh, committed uh, innovators, I think this kind of change can take mm -hmm. place. I have seen some countries yeah. where this kind of things uh, happened, uh, particularly in Africa, mm -hmm. in East Africa. And uh, people played around with the uh, figures of our supporters. Mm -hmm. And uh, by the, the people who were opposed to the change were very, literally number, but very influential. So you have to be uh, to play strategically mm -hmm. with the, the numbers. Mm -hmm. You know, going back to, you know, really uh, failed states and all that, you know, think about Rwanda. I think Rwanda way back was a real basket case. And people have very pointed it out. But, but today, it's doing much, much better. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's very interesting because, uh, you know, um, one of the things that uh, uh, the, the president, is it Prime Minister or Prime Minister? Uh, the president uh, basically began, no? Yeah. One of the things is basically kept on saying over and over again is that, you know, uh, think of yourself as Rwandans, not as Tutsis, not as Tutsis, you know? But that's what one does, right? And just keep on pounding it. You know, so that's, that's a communication. Mm -hmm. right? So I mean, over and over again, and probably in different ways of doing it. You know? uh, and, and so anyway, so uh, all I'm saying is that it's not hopeless, right? And, uh, but but there, it's, it's a long challenge, and then it's probably timing is of the essence. Mm -hmm. you know? But and, yeah, the way to think about it is that, you know, uh, if you understand this, when you see that the timing may be right, that's when the can come in. Okay? Uh, am I uh, over time, Kathy? Or can I a little, yeah, do, do the final one. Uh, the final one, okay, because this one has implications for many of our problems we can find. It's, okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, now, this is the tragedy of the commons. Okay, and I, I'm sure you can empathize with this, you know, from different experiences, okay? And these are very serious problems. Uh, around the world, the extractives would be, you know, want this, uh, okay? And let me just give a, a, a real world example of this, you know, um, from, uh, from my own country, you know. Um, there are places in, in, in my country where, you know, 30, 20, 30 years ago, you know, uh, they were fishing communities, right? They could make a living, a, a decent living, by, you know, catching fish and selling in the market. Selling it to the markets in the cities. Yeah. Now, uh, what happened over time is uh, technology, kind of a certain kind of technology, creep into this fishing 
you know, uh, 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 communities, right? And that technology is called dynamite fishing, right? I don't know if you've come across this in your, in your, in your own countries, but in, in, in my country, this became a really, really serious problem. Now, dynamite fishing is essentially, you put dynamite in there and then you just explode it. Wow, you know, all these fish come and you can catch a hell lot. Right? Now what happens is that, you know, one, one fisherman in the community will start this, right? The other fisherman will see, well, heck, he's getting a hell lot more catch than, than I am. I better start doing this as well. Now imagine what happens when everybody starts doing this. And this is really what happened in a number of our fishing communities. What do you think happens in fish? Yeah. Guys? Nice. And what do you think happens in the communities? Right. Right? No, no, no living, you know? no form of living. Right? So, and this is the tragedy of the commons. You know, the, 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 the ocean or the, the sea, you know, by the, uh, the village, is a commons, mm -hmm. right? It's commonly owned, right? It's not owned by John or Sylvia or what, and everyone in the community kind of owns it, right? And the tragedy of it is that, you know, basically there's a tendency for individuals to overexploit it. Yeah, because it's not, yeah, I didn't invest in that or whatnot, so let me just try to overexploit it. If everyone does it, then everyone suffers. Because that's a tragedy in the commons. And a bit, good example of that now in the global sea, you know, is this whole issue of climate change. Climate change is a serious tragedy of the commons, problem, right? And unless we get our act together on this, all countries, you know, at some point in time we could find our planet in real deep shit, you know, and all of us are, you know, uh, go down with the ship. So anyway, that's that. Uh, and this, I think, communications can do a hell lot on this. Because people don't understand this, right? And you, you know, you can make people understand this much, much better. The average person, you know, in the planet can be made to understand this. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna end there, and I hope you uh, remember this uh, different concepts, think of them as patterns. As you go along, as you're helping your, your teams, you're helping your, you know, your, 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 what they call this, your compatriots or whatnot, always be aware of these kinds of patterns. They may be emerging, and then you can actually respond accordingly to the communication strategies, okay?